Welcome to this masterclass with Mozart's Violin Concerto number no. 3, first movement. This movement and also the first movements of D major and A major are widely used as audition pieces, both if you want a job in an orchestra, but also if you want to get into academies, conservatories, music schools around. Today we will look at what lies behind the notes of the violin to see if the theoretical subjects like harmony, music theory, music history, analysis of these kind of subjects could help us actually play the pieces better. What do we know about Mozart if you look at music history? Do you know what, he, what his favorite gender of uh, music to compose? Do you, any of you know? Oprah, yes. Oprah. He, he was known if he was in, in the middle of a string trio or in the middle of some other piece and he got a commission for opera, he stopped composing this other piece right and started composing the opera because it was his absolute favorite thing to uh, compose. And this is a fact which we can sort of use to our advantage uh, when uh, performing Mozart. Other things we know that uh, Mozart's father, Leopold Mozart, was a um, violin teacher, wrote a book about violin playing, and there is lots of letters between Leopold and Wolfgang. So they discuss various aspects of playing violin, so there can be some in useful information from music history. I always recommend also that you use piano reductions like you have here now and we have here. It could be a very easy way to see harmony, what kind of harmony Mozart use, and that could be a very, very valuable source of inspiration while practicing. And if you want to see this music I play uh, from here, this is uh, eight pages of the score and if I have several stands, I can have actually the whole movement and move, move around in a big room. I usually spend some time making these kind of scores because uh, then you can actually practice from the score without having to turn pages all the time. I think turning pages all the time is probably one thing keeping people from actually practicing from scores because it's very, very annoying. So, but with sort of semi-modern technology, you can uh, make sort of big master score so I can I very much recommend that you try that and of course we have music analysis as a subject uh, which is a thought uh, around the world at academies and conservatories uh, and usually this is not applied to the pieces we actually play but sort of a separate um, subject but what I, I will concentrate here is try to find things from all the theoretic uh, which could inspire us to play maybe even better. So both of you played fantastic, uh, it was a joy to hear, but let's see if we can now uh, look into these matters and uh, find even more fun ways to, to play. So since we are two violinists playing this movement, let's start with opera. So uh, I think I would like to hear bar number... 64, but maybe we can have from 63 in the orchestra. And this for me seems very much like a scene from an opera, so let's divide it between you. Uh, you can ask the question, you can answer the question to see how would it feel to play it then. So from bar 63, please. <laughs> Excellent. So let's try that you ask the question and you answer. Excellent. So uh, the two same players, but it sounded completely different when we changed the roles. Let's see if you ask the first question and then you answer and then you ask a question back and he answers. How would it sound then? Yes, good. So, but of course, when we 
pr actually perform this, we are only one person playing it. So how would we then practice to become a bit schizophrenic so we can actually be both uh, parts from this opera? I would suggest to that we now can try to play these phrases in as many different ways as possible to find many ways to interpret it, interpret it. So let's try that you play the whole phrase, but should we give him, a, give him a task? What kind of character should this be? And when we practice here to get many options, we will try some obvious, very nice options, but we can also try some clearly not working solutions to do something radically different. So, I mean, this is not a sad theme, but if you were sad, where, how would you play it? It's from the same place? <laughs> It sounds a bit sad this way, I think. Uh, so, suggestions. Anybody has uh, any wishes? Angry. Angry? Yeah. yeah, let's hear it angry. <laughs> try some others try now to play really really like you have a big secret very humoristic one but you don't really want to tell us yet but you have very much fun with it <laughs> Let's try something completely different that you are very sleepy, like you went up really early this morning and had slept too little, and you're sort of tired. Let's hear it that way. Now let's hear it really, really happy. flirting like you see someone you like very much and you sort of smile and so let's now try again that you ask the questions you answer the questions but you should use two different characters but we won't know which before you play that's a really bizarre in this Mozart opera uh, they suddenly landed on the moon and what are we doing here <laughs> they were very confused but but it was I never ever heard it this way so it was uh, I think it's interesting I believe that what we call inspiration is actually things we have planted in our mind earlier. So the more different things you, you plant there to sort of grow and settle, you more, the more fun you can have it in concerts. So there isn't one way to play well, uh, but there is ways to generate enough material for your inspiration to have more to draw from. Because when we are doing it now, I think it's more alive than when we played it through because we might be thinking about fingerings, phrasings, other stuff like that, but I would like us to really think this as opera. So let's do this phrase one more time now and um, see if we can uh, do it as, uh, as a real opera, but only one person. So uh, one, on, one on one of you can play the whole phrase, but try to be two characters each. Again. Good now. Now we have done enough of this and after a while of course 
this also gets repetitive and tiring. Let's now look at the actual scores. What kind of harmonies did Mozart write? In, in the second theme, so it is actually in D major. So it starts in the tonica and it ends in the tonica. And then we get some other chords uh, in the middle. Or it actually starts sort of in between dominant and tonica. D minor. And then back again to tonica. Actually, words tonica dominant are quite interesting in itself. That dominant dominates most of the time of the tonica, and that's why uh, this got its name. So usually, the tonica would be the least important chord in a phrase, and dominance and subdominance would be more important. But there are, of, of course, cases where it could be completely different as well. But if, if the first answer is not really with a uh, period after it doesn't stop. So, question, but we end in E minor, and then we end again in tonica. This could tell us something about also what kind of story we are dealing with in, in this particular opera. Of course, again, there is not one single answer, and quite often I would just let it after raising questions like that, trying a lot of the characters, I would not decide how I'm going to play it, but leave that for later. So I think even now we can leave it for later and try some other uh, aspects. Actually, I noticed that both of you did not play in the beginning as is uh, not usual to do with piano, but uh, if you were to play with orchestra, of course you would be hopefully part of the orchestra and play from the beginning. <laughs> together with the orchestra, as Mozart has written in the score. So it could always be useful, even if it's not used in modern auditions, to practice uh, the piece from the beginning. Also because then when a theme returns, for instance, when, when you actually started to play, that's the second time we hear this theme. And this is a valuable information for us to know. There is difference of bowings in the beginning. In the tutti, it's written with three bows. But when the solo comes, it's written and also some other great notes. So we, we are going to discuss some sort of possibilities. Why, why is it different? Both. Do you have any possible explanations? I would like us to always sort of ask questions while practicing. Why does the solo violin not have the same bowing as the tutti had in the beginning of the movement? Anybody has any suggestions for why? Supposed to be more anonymous, and then when the yes. solo enters, it has to be something different. Yeah, it could be very well that. I, I did bring the manuscript, and it's also interesting. If you, if you come over here, we can actually look in, uh, in the scores. And here, yes, it's a forte piano. And when the solo enters, as usual, Mozart never writes any dynamics for the solo violin. The orchestra still plays forte piano. Are we going to play forte piano, like in the beginning, or not? Again, there isn't a straight answer for this. But we know from some letters between Mozart and his father that they were discussing, because they played with the Baroque bow at this time, but in France, they had already made the modern violin bow. So they were discussing about this French bow and Leopold writes to Mozart, this is very strange that they choose to play with this bow up in the air half the time with half the sound of the violin. Why do they do that? He writes, which would suggest that maybe this is much closer to Baroque that they played actually on the string, maybe they did. And not the sort of like we do today. 
I don't know. And actually, I've spoken with a lot of early music experts, and you get different answers from each of them. So, but I would like us to sort of discuss the possibilities of this phrase. What, what, what can we do? So, if you do now the opening, uh, like it was written much closer to the Baroque era, try the bowing that we. <laughs> Think about the fact I just told you that uh, Leopold said, why would I play with this modern type of bow with half the sound up in the air all, like they do in France? So probably he played with full sound. So let's see how it would sound then. So maybe two bars before? Yes, and of course this can be done very many different ways. Let's try it that way, but with slightly less modern type of vibrato. Almost no vibrato, maybe. Something like that. And now, Actually, I prefer the way you played before. Let's hear uh, how we did it before. Yes, that, that makes me more happy, but you, you would have some early music experts maybe telling you, no, but this is not how they played it at Mozart's time. You should do this and this. And you get into a discussion, what is right, what is wrong, and it, that's never a very interesting discussion. But what is interesting is to try it very, very many different ways so you can find the way you like most. Now we tried sort of two very different ways of uh, playing this phrase, but we should... So is there some way you can do this bowing here? <laughs> Not the two down bows and get close to what you like yourself. Let's hear. Yes. So always when we get into discussions, this or this, it will be easy. But now you did in between, and now I kind of liked it. Now I don't know is this. What do you prefer yourself, this or what you started with? It's okay not to I be sure. I think both of them are pretty good. Yeah, me too. I think yeah. both of them are pretty good as well. So, but if that's the ideal situation in a way to have two good solutions, if you can find five good ways to play it, five different bowings for, uh, for that matter, then you have more to choose from. And I think the more we have to choose from, the better choices we can make. We just do not jump into the first and best uh, solution we can think about. So it could be like you said, this is why we looked here, that it could be to differentiate so... <laughs> if uh, Tutti is doing something, let's try from the very beginning then. <laughs> And then the solos come in. Oh, yeah, yeah no, that's fine, actually. <laughs> you naturally don't want to do exactly the same as the orchestra have done before. You need to do something else, which is why I would recommend you to always practice the tutti first, because it can make you do better choices when it returns. Because it's not the first time the audience hear it, so they will be bored if it's the exactly same way. And you might be able to make better choices 